Welcome back to TDK12.net, Practical Advice for Expats. This is episode 15, and normally episodes take me a few days to make. I make some graphics, I have to do some research, but this one is going to be pretty easy and pretty quick. What's been going around on social media? Well, people have been working from home or working remotely because their schools have been closed because of coronavirus. And now schools are readjusting. They're planning for people to come back and they're looking at the number of days they've had in session and they have decided that they need more days in session. So they're telling teachers in some places, um, you're going to have to cancel your spring break. I have confirmation from one school that is said, and you're going to have to work Saturdays after spring break until the end of the year, at least half days, to make up the time. Now, the question is, do I have to work on spring break? I've been seeing that. And the answer is yes, absolutely yes. Now, I understand the argument. The school told you to go home or not come into work. The school told you to teach remotely. The schools had you meet your students online, and let's say you've been the perfect employee and your students have been the perfect students, you've actually been following your schedule and working full days minus certain activities and delivering your curriculum. So you feel like you've met all your requirements and the school should honor that. Here's the reality of the situation. Now, first off, I'm going to tell you why you absolutely have to do it unless you have some weird contract, which I have never seen, and I guess that's possible. But I'll get into that last, because I do want to take a different view. I want to take the view of the school administration. The school administration has a contract, not just with the teachers, but with the parents. And As recently as two weeks ago in the United States, the National Association of Independent Schools called an emergency web webcast. And they put this out and they said, all administrators this evening, join us. We're going to talk about how to get prepared for coronavirus just in case. And a lot of that preparation was modifying enrollment contracts. Pull your enrollment contracts out right now. Review them. Do your enrollment contracts allow for you to not have a school session at school? Meaning, can you count a remote session as in session? Does it count towards the days you've promised the parents? If you think it's going to be a problem, ask your attorney. This is in this conference. Ask your attorney to review it immediately to see if you can force and or strongly encourage families to sign an amended enrollment contract immediately, just in case. Now, a lot of schools are just taking a community approach. They reached out to their parents. They explained what this is going to look like. And basically, we can't really do refunds, but this is our plan right now before it happens. This gives the parents some time to think about it, and hopefully these schools are going to send something to the parents so the parents opt in for this new plan because you want to go for the win-win. In a lot of countries, you can't do this. Your enrollment contract can't be amended, and you're not allowed to include things like, if school is canceled for flu and we teach at home, it's the same as teaching in class. You're just not allowed to do it, or somebody didn't think about it. There could be a million reasons, but the fact is the parents have a contract, and usually that contract is connected to something like, Uh, The school year is 182 days. If we take a field trip for a week or a week without walls, that counts. So they'll say those seven days count. All that's defined. The parents expect the school to meet that standard. If the school hasn't in any way planned for defined what remote teaching looks like, and if they don't have parents who've opted into that, you can get into a sticky situation. Your best case scenario is not to have a lot of students turn over. Healthy schools don't have high student turnover. They want students to go year to year until they graduate. 
And if you have students who are older, they need those hours. And you might be thinking, oh, online hours are the same as in-class hours. They can be after you get to a certain point in your practice. But initially, a first, especially the first week or two, I think most schools are finding it quite difficult to deliver the same classroom experience across the board. You might have a few rock star teachers who can do it, but some people are really struggling. And they are really trying hard, and they're still really struggling. You have kids who have been trapped in different time zones who can't attend. You have parents who don't have a say because they're trapped somewhere away from their kids. You have people who, for whatever reason, at their home might not have the same connectivity options. And you develop these different levels of equity for accessing the curriculum. And now you have a problem. The school is going to try its best in most of these cases to reclaim those days. And they're looking at the situation like this. Yes, you've been teaching remotely, but it's very hard for us to, to manage. And, you know, there was a week or two where maybe not everything was working smoothly and we didn't have our requirements together because just, just kind of sprung up around us and we struggled. And it's not necessarily extra vacation, but it's also not the same as going to work every day. And so that we can stay in business and so that you have a job and so that we're not giving a lot of refunds, we need you to teach on spring break. You've been teaching remotely and you're not mad about the spring break, but you currently are in country A, which seems to be fine. And you're having to go back to country B, which just went through a little bit of a coronavirus scare. And maybe there's some cases, maybe more cases than country A. So why should you travel, right? And I understand that too. Let's look at this from just a little bit, from a little bit different of a vantage point. So a new vantage point. You know, based on the pattern, that when the coronavirus hits a country, the first few weeks are worse than the last few weeks. So you want to be on the other side of that line. You don't want to be on the first few weeks line. You want to be towards the end. I think it's fair to say that once places get a hold of the problem and start managing it, they start to improve. They start to have cases trail off and they start quarantining people. They have better health procedures. Everything improves. If you're in country A and nothing's really happened yet, you have to ask yourself if you think it's going to happen because if it does happen, then you're just going to experience the inconveniences of country B, but maybe without a job because you decided to resign and that might be be without an income, and maybe without health care. I'm not really sure. All I'm saying is, if you're being invited back to some place that is on the other side of it, and seems to have things in, under control, then you're probably better off making the move back and taking precautions. It just seems like that is logical at this stage. But it's a decision you have to make, and... Someone like me can't tell you how to make that decision. I'm just giving you my perspective. I would want to make sure I was employed, had income, and had insurance. That would be my main goals and the same goals for my family. Now, let's talk about your family. If you're the only person that's working and you have a spouse and a child who, who you know aren't working, your spouse isn't working, your child may not need to go to the school because of their age, you could consider a very difficult plan, but where you go back to work and they stay with family, that's an option. If both of you are working at the school, but you have a child, I think a lot of schools might, I think some schools, not a lot. Not, I wouldn't say a lot. That I totally misspoke. Let's just say out of 100, I think 15 or 20 would be understanding and allow one person to stay with the child and the other one come back to work. It's not a great solution, but it's also not a complete loss for the school, and they should have some sympathy. I guess it would depend on how many people are asking for that accommodation. So I, I, I could understand those scenarios and that type of negotiating coming forward. If you have an idea, I think it's worth bringing it up if you feel like there's a negotiation, but consider that the school needs you to physically be with the students in order to meet this enrollment requirement and not to have to process a lot of refunds. That's, that's important. 
working on Saturdays. Um, and I should have put a little, t a little, uh, note up here. Can my school ask me to work on Saturdays here? I'll just do it in real time. I'm sure I can handle this. Can I be asked to work on Saturdays? And I'll cancel this. And if you're wondering what tool I'm using, because you might be doing online learning, I'm using Google Jamboard, which I like a lot. It's simple, fast, and it never seems to fail. Can I ask, ask to be work? Can I ask to work? Can I be asked to work on Saturdays? Let me get that right. Can I be asked to work on Saturdays? Yes, absolutely you can. Because I believe 99% of contracts have some language in them that says, these are your duties, but at any point you can be signed additional duties by the head of school. Or you'll fulfill these duties and also any additional duties assigned by the head of school. Very few contracts in international education stipulate things like you work Monday to Friday or you only work 40 hours a week. That is uh, not normal. I've never seen that. And the reason is because international schools can face all kinds of issues. They can have closures for all these different reasons. Uh, my school once was closed because President George Bush came to visit and we didn't have school for like two days. Just random stuff happens, and the country shuts down to accommodate it, and you still have to make up days to meet enrollment contracts. So there's usually language in the contract somewhere that stipulates that. Let's say that your school isn't smart enough to write a good contract. It's not common, but let's say it happened, and you're looking for a loophole. You don't really have a loophole. You need to work the schedule until the year is out. If you're unhappy, that's totally fine. However, I can tell you that if you decide to change jobs and the new job says, why are you leaving? Oh, well, you know how coronavirus closed my closed our schools? Like, it closed our school for, like, you know, two months, and then there was this big thing, and they wanted us to work on Saturdays, and I just didn't really want to work on Saturdays, and I didn't think it was fair. That's probably not going to help you get a new job, but it's a choice that you can make. I just highly discourage it. Work the schedule. Help your school get through this. Um... I believe that the main concern you should have is yourself and your family, and you should be working towards building your career, saving money, having health care, and working your way into a good summer where you can relax, and you can still do all that, and you can meet all those goals. You're just going to be inconvenienced um, for a while, and remember, you don't really have that many Saturdays if you have to do them, and most schools are only probably going to require half days to meet enrollment contracts. If your school feels like they have to do Saturdays, but they don't know how, this is an opportunity to help. It is very easy to put together condensed schedules. You would not believe how much time is wasted in the schedule. If you don't know what I mean, and you don't think anyone can help you do that, reach out to me. I've made many, many schedules in my life, and I'm happy to give you some ideas for that. All right, well, I hope everybody actually has a safe return back to work and finds a win-win and peace with their employer and gets through this in a healthy and productive way. And being angry and being angry on social media and lashing out definitely isn't going to help you achieve any of your goals. And you should always be focused on your goals and staying financially strong, strong with your family, and healthy. Until next time, thank you for listening to tdk12.net, practical advice for expats.